Paul said, now the wall of partition has been removed. Now there is only one new man in Christ. There aren't, you know, in, and of course, in Galatians, it also talks about, well, there's no Jew nor gentle. There's no bond or free and there's no male or female in the kingdom. It's all one. We don't have these delineations anymore. So it's a challenge. And I know, you know, even posting this will probably offend a lot of people. You know, I come from that background. I come from a brethren background. I come from the, the, that route that actually created all this problem with Darby and the, you know, premillennialist dispensationist teaching, you know, and the Schofield Bible that promoted it and all of that. You know, I understand the nature and the history of it, you know, but it doesn't excuse what is going on in the Middle East right now. I've been uh, on uh, calls and stuff, and there's so many people, and, and they're Christians, and they're all ill and in chronic pain, and and just struggling so much, and and like they believe that that by Jesus stripes they are healed, and yet they're still their journey's still so hard. So my question is, um, can we love our bodies back to life? as we journey with Jesus, because it seems like sometimes we just mm. get so frustrated that our bodies are working that it's hard to love our bodies, I think, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, I, I think the viewing um, healing as something to get from God rather than a state of living in health and ultimately immortality, I think is a mindset shift. And I think a lot of people believe God heals. Some people believe that in the kingdom, the kingdom of God is coming and not yet. So they give themselves a sort of get out clause. Well, it's not yet yet, so it might not happen. Um, and some people believe, yes, it's in the atonement. And Jesus died for our sickness as well as our death and sin, because you know, they're all completely linked. You know, the wages of sin is death. Sickness is what leads to death. So they're all linked in that whole complex of of our lost identity because sin is lost identity therefore if the wages of our lost identity is death then knowing who we are brings life but you've got to know who you are and i think a lot of people don't know really who they are they know their christian sense of what the bible says but do they know their identity that health wholeness immortality is their inheritance that as a child of god their inheritance is fullness of abundant life which includes health and wholeness and and all of the the blessings of of god's desire for us as his children and i think a lot of people don't know how to love their bodies or actually they are have bought into the philosophy that the body's going to die anyway one day and they're already committed to death as everyone dies. Therefore, if everyone is going to die, then your body's going to pack up at some point. You know, so it's a it's a complex issue, which I think requires a shift in the knowledge of our identity and therefore our inheritance as children of God. And then also recognizing the body is an equal part with the spirit and the soul. It's not a lesser part. It's not the part, well, it's going to wear out one day and we'll get a new one. It is it is an equal part. Therefore, understanding the union of spirit, soul and body, of having no contradiction within that and no competition also within spirit, soul and body, that the soul and spirit are equally blessed. And also knowing that within our the core of our innermost being, we can generate health with the river of life energy flowing in us to generate the energy to replenish our physical bodies, the cells of our bodies, to ensure that we are in wholeness in every way, spirit, soul, body. And I think there's a lot of teaching in the sort of evangelical view, which views the body as less than. And well, it's going to die one day. So focus on your soul and your spirit. You know, well, we need to focus on our body equally with spirit and soul and give the value and worth to our body that we give to our spirit and soul. And therefore, 
yeah, loving our body, cooperating with our body, treating our body with respect and honor and blessing. And, you know, you can't abuse your body and expect to have a whole body. You know, you've got to treat it with love. That is a sense of, I value my body as much as I value my spirit and soul, because my body will also continue in an immortal state, you know? And, and I think if we get hold of that, we can then look at how we value our body. That means how we eat, how we look after ourselves. Are we healthy in a, the amount of sleep, exercise, how, you know, keeping our body healthy, not just in an assumption, oh, well, God will do it because no, we, we are also responsible to work together with God in the sense of spirit, soul and body and therefore valuing it. And I think there are things which people can do to help keep their body healthy in terms of vitamins and making sure they've got a good balanced diet, you know, which which is not you know, fatty diets. You know, well, I'm going to be on a, you know, an Atkins diet and eat protein only, or I'm going to eat this and less of this. No, we've got to, we have a balanced diet, but not a diet which in which we abuse too much sugar, too much salt. You know, generally be know what it is to be healthy. You know, know what it is to, to have a healthy amount of sleep, a healthy amount of exercise, you know, and, and, and a mindset towards our body in loving it will bring a value which then we will look after it you know we can't expect to live in health if we abuse our body now there are factors that could be genetic there could be epigenetic factors within our family lines which could affect our body and the susceptibility to certain disease or certain uh genetic or epigenetic factors that could bring something into our bodies which are not healthy but then we can deal with that we can deal with that in communion by taking communion or living in communion which is a better state of that to live in a state of communion is to live in a state of health and well-being and therefore our our whole body can be also in that state of health and well-being with a dealing with the fact that we are a new creation in christ and therefore we can expect a restoration of our dna and epigenetic factors to make sure we we live in our new creation new man in christ healthy body not our oh i've i've inherited my body from adam and from my parents in adam and therefore well i've inherited death yeah everyone died in adam you know, but all are made alive in Christ. So we need to also know what belongs to us as part of our salvation experience. And we know salvation as a word is what way more than just spiritually not, you know, going to heaven one day when you die. And that's the covenant that people have brought in. They think the new covenant is you go to heaven when you die rather than living heaven on earth while you live. And in fact, not dying at all. So I think there's a lot to think about. And when people are struggling health wise, they have a lot of factors in play. Fear often is in play in those things. And, you know, if they are frustrated with, well, why am I not? Why am I not healed? Maybe they're looking for healing rather than health and immortality. And healing can come in different ways. We can contribute to believing in health and therefore, you know, ensuring sickness does not have a part to play in our physical bodies. And but also we can have a, a healthy balance within our emotions also, making sure that we're not living in worry or anxiety or fear or unforgiveness or anger or bitterness, because those contribute to the physical detriment to the body because they're toxic emotions. If we live with toxic emotions, then we're going to probably suffer sickness in the body. So we've got to deal with our emotions as well and make sure we're living in that state of well-being. So I find that a lot of people who are sick are wholly focused on some way getting healing. 
And the healing is a byproduct of our relationship with God and well-being and living a new covenant life. It isn't something that should be the focus of our life. Our relationship with God should be the focus of our life. And that should be the number one priority. But what I've seen in prayed for a lot of people over the years in terms of who've had sickness of various sorts is they tend to get very focused on I need my healing. You know, and, and that can be to the detriment of their relationship with God. And in sometimes they even blame God for not healing them. You know, and they have, a, have this frustrated attitude, um, which is not, again, healthy it can be toxic to the body you know so i think there's a whole lot of factors that come together if we're going to live healthily and live free from sickness and disease and ultimately live in, in an immortal sense both in the quality and quantity of that life then we have to readdress a lot of thinking about how we think about ourselves how we think about god and how we treat our bodies in honor and respect and if we do do anything that's contradictory to loving our bodies we need to be apolog apologized for that we need to treat our body as an equal partner within the union of spirit soul and body and therefore function together you know and i operate within the cells of my body to ensure health and that well-being but if i do something to contradict that if I've been careless, you know, and for me, that's often accidents in the garden or the workshop, then, you know, I, I look after it myself. And I, when I was on holiday in Vietnam and I was in the Chu Chi tunnels, which is the tunnels the Viet Cong built near Saigon, and they had thousands of people living underground, we went to visit that area. And I, I was in this tunnel and they were like, you know two foot six high so it was like quite difficult for me to get around in this tiny tunnel and it was dark and it was a hundred meter tunnel and they had sort of exit routes every 20 meters and i was 50 meters into it and the tunnel took a slight shift which i couldn't see in the dark and basically i i slipped and head butted the floor and took the skin off sort of my chin nose top lip and forehead and eye and i i hurt my eye socket had a big black eye took the skin totally off and blood everywhere you know and it's like you know i would i mean i didn't know what i'd done i could just feel wet flowing down my face oh god i've cut my head open or something but i got out eventually and uh and then i had to a deal with the fear and the trauma immediately because i didn't want that to take root so i started smiling and I didn't have this sort of negative thing. And Debbie was like, oh, what have you done? And, you know, and, and then it's like, oh, OK, let's wash it off. And I found some water and washed all, all the blood off. And, you know, I was a bit of a state, but I maintained at that point that I didn't let fear or worry or anxiety come in. I, I operated at that point to deal with the trauma and I released the trauma. And it was my fault. It was an accident. But I, you know. I slipped and and my elbows were too tight to the wall and my knees and I couldn't stop myself going forward. So I had nothing to stop my fall. It was just a two foot six bang into the ground, you know, and but I had to, you know, deal with that. And I had to deal with uh, my body and, you know, looking to see no infection because, you know, I mean, I washed off, washed it off with water coming out of a bamboo. You know, so who knows what was in it? But immediately I was on it and I was already choosing the reality that there would be no infection. I was choosing the reality that this would be speedily healed, you know, because I looked a mess. You know, you're on holiday vacation, you know, so I was like, I had this great scab all over my face. Um, but, you know, I, I dealt with the trauma. I released the trauma immediately. You know, I, I worked in cooperation with my body and within less than a week, the whole thing had gone. You know, I had no, no physical marks, you know, so I thought, oh, God, I'm going to come home and have a great big scarred up face. But actually, I didn't. I chose. No. And I had to capture the thoughts because I thought, oh, 
you know, how long is this going to take to heal? Well, then it's like, no, I'm going to work with the, my, the cells of my body to repair themselves, you know, quickly. And, and it did. And people in the tour were really, they said, well, you heal quickly. Cause, cause you know, it was literally within a week, it had all gone. And so, uh, you know, very quickly it healed up, but I had to work with it in multiple factors to ensure that I didn't allow anything to hinder a me enjoying the holiday and b you know, any infection or anything else and people kept offering me antiseptic creams i quite a lot of the ladies from canada they were like oh i've got i've got antiseptic cream with me and and i've got uh, antibiotic cream with me yeah i'll, I'll give you some and i'm, I'm like, so this, it's all right i'll be okay uh, and i didn't want to put anything on it because i wanted it to heal and and often you know, having it to the air actually makes it heal quicker. And I, and I was working with that. So, you know, you've got to work at these things. You know, it, it isn't automatic. Some people are believing for gifts of healing. So they're looking for someone to lay hands on them with a gift of healing. And the, the gifts of healing are, you know, part of the Holy Spirit's gifting to some people at some times. It's no guarantee. You know, some people are believing for healing and they believe that Jesus died so that they could be healed um but they don't necessarily know how to work and cooperate with that they're still expecting it to be a miracle well it'll just happen you know whatever and miracles do happen and i'm not saying they don't but actually miracles are a lesser than kind of life because god wants us to live in health and we can't keep relying on being healed with other people healing us or miracles are healing God wants us to learn how to live in health as children of God, because that is our inheritance. You know, so there are a lot of factors there, I think. With And sometimes none of us know what's going on on the inside of someone who's not sit, not healed. We don't know. We don't know what their emotions are. We don't know what, if anything, they may have done to contribute to that, both physically and spiritually, emotionally. We don't know. You know, and, and I've, you know, I've prayed for people or visited people who are being, you know, terminal and they've asked me to pray and they're absolutely adamant. Oh, I'm not going to die. I totally believe that I'm going to be healed. But there was something that didn't feel that way with some of them when I, when I went to them, you know, and I just, you know, I it felt like. I can't agree with you because I don't think you're being real. I think you're in denial. You know, the whole Christian scientist people deny illness and sickness. They're in denial over it. They don't deal with it. You know, and I think we have to learn how to deal with it and cooperate with the body in dealing with it, which is, you know, a process of learning how to do that. Yeah. Uh, Mike, the, yeah. you mentioned abundant life, and that, that is actually prosperity in spirit, soul, and body, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it, it requires, it's like a three-legged stool in uh, prosperity, then there is freedom, and there's um, uh, the truth. And the truth about ourselves, like most of the people who ask to you to lay hands on they are expecting uh, the power to come from an external source yeah when the res resurrected life is within them and we should be tapping that right um, yeah absolutely and i don't think many people know how to generate the energy to live day to day you know they're, they're tired they're weary they're they're running out of energy they don't have enough creative energy they don't have what is needed because they don't know how to focus that abundant life, which is at the core of their innermost being, and generate it and choose to activate the energy gates within our body to be able to facilitate everything. And I don't think that's taught at all, because obviously a lot of evangelicals would be horrified if you start talking about energy gates and stuff within. It's, oh, it's all new agey and it's all weird stuff. Oh, we don't have anything to do with that. You know, and in reality, 
they are missing out on a huge part of how we were designed to function and to be able to generate energy by focusing living water if you want to call it that or light energy i mean lots of analogies of it but we're talking about spiritual life the abundance of spiritual life which is flowing from our innermost being but most people don't even know how to open the gateway to let that happen or to let all the other gateways be open of their spirit soul and body to enable that flow so most people are living on a trickle when they should be living on a flood because they've never been taught and in fact you know a lot of christians would teach the opposite to that and be you know completely contradictory to that and therefore i understand why a lot of christians are struggling or do struggle with understanding abundant life and the flow of it because they never been taught they never been taught that they are a tripart being and the spirit soul and body need to be in union they've never been taught how to activate and open that door so that it becomes a state of being that we live in this total state of communion with life because jesus is in us the spirit's in us the father lit dwells within us but are we embracing that or are we looking as you say for an external source are we looking to someone to place an anointed charge of energy that will heal but many people who do get healed end up dying anyway or end up getting sick again because they don't know how to maintain the healing that they received because they have not generated that themselves they've only received it from someone else therefore they don't know how to maintain it and people generally who minister healing are very much lay hands bang move on they don't teach someone how to maintain health and well-being generally not part of that remit they're really sort of let's say hands on the sick and see them recover you know and they are genuinely people who operate in those gifts and they genuinely see miracles and healings but how many go back and testify how many after a year are those people still healed because if there were factors contributing to their sickness healing would be temporary if they don't deal with the factors that are contributing to the sickness so i think is a there's a way that we need to teach people how to live in abundant life how to embrace well-being and living in a state of well-being and to live in a state of wealth not just monetary wealth but wealth in every way emotional wealth you know that we are living in a state of, of abundance you know and jesus promised abundant life so of course the enemy wants to rob kill and destroy and if he can stop people knowing the truth and believing lies then they're never going to live in the abundance that's theirs they've been robbed you know and so again i think it's all about the relationship we have with god that is the source of that life what source are we drinking from are we drinking from that fountain that bubbles up to eternal life or are we drawing from everyday life and that around us are we drawing from church are we drawing from other sources christian sources but aren't jesus because we need to draw from life jesus said you know if you drink the water i'll give you you'll have rivers of living water flowing from your innermost being and that he said is the spirit so it's spiritual life which is the source of god in us that we need to draw from not techniques to get healing or other things but to live in abundance and to be blessed by that abundance but it's relational and i think that's the key it's not a it's not a formula it's a relationship and therefore we need to have a relationship with life yeah and it is resurrection life you know that is in us jesus breathed onto his disciples and said receive the spirit receive these rivers of living water drink of it you know and the whole of mankind although they have that spirit within them don't know how to drink from that source they're looking for external sources rather than the source at the 
in in their innermost being. So they're trying everything from the outside in. You know, and ultimately, I'm not saying some of those sources may well be transition resources, which are good. Frequencies and energies and light and sound therapies and all those things. Great, because they work and rife frequencies and all of that stuff. But ultimately, I believe they're only transitionary things until we live in full health and abundance, which is a state of our own well-being and our own health and immortality, not dependent on external circumstances. Because I know lots of people are working on, you know, things to help people extend their life. You know, if you listen to Justin Abraham, he's very much into the modern technology and people who are talking about immortality who are not necessarily christians but they're looking to develop things to help people extend their life you know and they're talking about well in within 20 years probably we, we will you know be able to live at least uh, you know 100 years more now that could be nanotechnology it could be other things but you're relying on something that someone's going to sell you and are they going to sell you it as a one-off or is it going to be an ongoing maintenance fee that's going to cost you? You know, and what happens if they suddenly pull the plug or they go out of business or whatever? Who knows? So, you know, although these things are temporarily something which could be a solution to those people who are unable to live in a state of health and well-being, I don't think they're ultimately the, the best solution, which I think comes from the life that's in us. And learning how to draw from that and draw from that source and embrace that source because it's a relational source. You can't draw from the source independently of the relationship with the source. So we need to have that relationship with Father, Son and Spirit within us and realize we're in a state of I am. When Jesus said, you know, where I am, you may be also because I'm in the Father and the Father's in you in John 14 is on that day resurrection day you're going to know that i'm in you you're in me and we're in the father basically we've got this relationship now which is completely different than what you knew when i was only here in the flesh now i'm able to dwell within the spirit and that brings a whole different source of life but how many people are still looking for the externals um rather than developing the relationship which will draw and drink from the right source the church is not the right source christianity is not the right source god is the right source drawing from that life that's in us and embracing and living in the fullness and abundance of that life is is what i think we should be focusing on not some external solution or whatever now obviously if you're sick and someone can help you with frequencies and various things to get you to a point of health. Great. You know, I'm not, not knocking that, you know, even medical science and whatever else can help. You know, if you need it and you haven't got the ability to create it yourself. Well, you know, I'm not knocking that because it has a part to play. But once you are healthy, how do you stay healthy? And that is how do you stay in that state of well-being? you know and and wholeness which is comes only from the relationship of union with father son and spirit hmm. mike there is a force out there that uh, does not want us to understand the abundant life and where it stems from i mean they would like to keep us imprisoned in our own minds um yeah. not to uh, um i mean there are a lot of people I would call what you say the current word is misinformation and disinformation right yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, it, there's massive massive of sort of organized force in preventing us from going into the next level of consciousness mm. right because this would change everything change how the world functions like and um, the, the the realization that heaven if uh, affects earth mm. yeah i mean essentially the enemy is a liar from the beginning and whoever is working 
in that system is propagating those lies and therefore keeping people deceived, keeping people in darkness, keeping people from the truth, and therefore keeping people from health and immortality. And, you know, that's big business. I mean, who, who controls most of the world's money? You know, big corporations. And the biggest of those corporations are energy and pharma. So pharma institutions have got no real incentive to, to health and wholeness. They'd be out of business. So they don't want you to know that you can live in health and wholeness. Hence, they do disperse disinformation about energy and energy healing and life and abundance and you know even the technologies that are available there you know you're not even allowed to buy them in the u.s you know you've got you've got to sort of import them um and be careful about it because of things you know there's all sorts of things about you know royal rife and the rife frequencies and you know the mysterious nature of his death and destruction of his you know information and and discoveries yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there which is designed to keep control with the people who maintain that stuff. And they often control the media. So they control big media institutions and also maybe the algorithms that keep us you know, seeing deceptive posts and seeing things which confuse or disseminate stuff or hide things within conspiracy a theory and everything else you know and i think they there is a promotion of that you know you, you deception is part of the tool the enemy uses to keep us from the truth keep us in darkness keep us in darkness to who we are keep us in darkness to our sonship keep us in darkness towards health and immortality you know focusing that no i think Oh, people are awakening so you're going to find that there are much more well-known sources that are now beginning to gain popularity and are overcoming that misinformation and disinformation because they're doing it in a very organized and uh, professional way and they're seeing results you know and as soon as you start seeing great results then people start to take notice of the testimony that they're hearing. So I do feel that awakening is taking place. And I do feel that the darkness is being dispelled by the light. And therefore, there's a lot of light being shone on these issues right now. You know, and, and I think it's a topic which is beginning to gain big traction. And there are a lot of people talking about it. I mean, I was talking to Justin a few weeks ago and he was telling me that he did this conference with some people in the US. I mean, I'd never heard of them, but they were you know, massively talking about immortality in different ways, about uh, an economy of immortality. And, you know, because if, you, if you're not going to die, you've got to be able to sustain life. Well, obviously, if you're a breatharian, then you don't need to eat much. So that, that's one aspect that could be a solution to some people. But I don't believe that God necessarily wants us to go without food and, and not enjoy Jesus at before and after the cross. So, you know, and I think he's a, he's a good illustration to us to say food is a good thing, you know, but not something that should ultimately stop us if we need to be able to live without it and i think there's lots of different ways that people are beginning to embrace that now and more people are beginning to start talking about these issues in different ways you know we're doing a conference in wales with justin and lindy strong in november on the subject of immortality you know and that subject is because each of us feels that god has stirred us in that area to both live and to demonstrate and to help other people come into that you know so i think it's it's powerful um and we need to be disseminators of truth and light and not get deceived ourselves and 
to to make sure that how we share the truth is credible you know because some people discredit christians because they're naive sometimes and and they share things in a way which just is not credible and i think we need to make sure we're credible you know i mean people post people posted stuff you know which is totally not true you know christians posting stuff about the science of various things you know i'm not going to mention them but you know it was just like really seriously you believe that you know it just shows no credibility at all you know but you get people christians who post stuff without any research without any checking of facts and they just disseminate misinformation and disinformation you know and quite often i don't know how many times i've seen on facebook well, i don't see it now because i've sort of the algorithms cut out a lot of the stuff i don't see anymore and i, and I you know and i legislate for not seeing rubbish i don't want to be caught up with seeing a whole load of rubbish so i see the stuff i want to see but i was seeing i probably saw about I don't know, a dozen times oh harvest signed harvard scientists discover that the name of jesus is embedded within the code of our dna and it's like really so go and look at the harvard thing science thing reviews see it and it's nowhere you know it's one of these spoof things that was on a spoof site that some christian reposted and reposted and someone else posted 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 and now it's all oh, the truth wow our dna has got god embedded in it well in one sense yes but not in the way that 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 was promoted and i saw that time and time again and i got fed up with saying this is a spoof don't be so silly you know yeah, you know, because Christians are naive and gullible because they believe what they think they what they want to believe. And actually, a lot of that then then is sort of this disinformation. Which makes other Christians then seem less credible as well, when people do come out with promoting truth and, and stuff, people dismiss it. Oh, well, Christians again, you know. Yeah. And I think that's also part of the tactics is to just is to almost smear, smear Christians with this sort of sense of, well, they're all just, you know, non-scientific, you know, and they don't have any credibility. You know, and I think we do need to do something about that and make sure what we do say and what we do disseminate out there and information wise do it is done in a credible professional way which is why you know i like people like lindy who work with doctors and they're working towards developing wellness centers you know i know nancy's got a wellness center they're looking to actually do things in a way which is much more credible um you know and therefore we'll um I think hopefully open the door for more and more of that to take place. But we've got to be careful. We just don't buy into the lies and deception. I mean, how many in Canada and America were convinced the end of the world was coming because you had an eclipse? I mean, how ridiculous. There's an eclipse somewhere in the world every 18 months. It's like, but when it comes to America, the world is going to end. Jesus is coming back. The rapture's here. I mean, it's like, how ridiculous. And now we've gone another, past another date and all those posts and so-called prophetic people just make Christians seem stupid. And actually, quite frankly, they are. If they believe that stuff. Now, again, fortunately, I didn't see much post of that because I've culled most of that stuff from my feeds of everything but i other people were saying oh have you heard so and so you heard this i'm like god i don't want to know you know i'm really not interested you know if you can go and see the eclipse it'll be a great thing to see don't think it's the end of the world because you happen to have an eclipse and why is it only when it's in america that it's going to be the end of the world. There's one in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and the different places all over the world all the time. You know, every every 18 months or so. But as soon as it's in America, suddenly 
this has got prophetic significance to the end of the world. Oh, it's no wonder, you know, there's a lack of credibility. Yeah, and a lot of dis this, you know, disinformation, misinformation. You know, we need we need to be careful what we post, and we need to fact check it with Jesus, the truth. You know, and you know, it may not agree with other things. I don't care about that, but I want to know that it carries the frequency and resonance of truth on it. If I'm going to post it or recommend it. Uh, I mean, what's going on in Israel at the moment also. Uh, ideology. Some people still take sides. And mm. the thing is that when when a person dies through any, any sort of uh, means other than natural death, everybody should be, uh, should realize that, uh, you know, taking a life, no matter what the circumstances, Jesus would never, um, it would always say, t talk about peace and forgiveness. Yep. And you and you you find you like people taking sides, and no one is thinking of of meeting the other halfway and and talking about peace and saving lives at the moment. Yeah, no, I know, but a lot of that is comes from a theological position that Israel are the people, exactly. of God, and therefore they've got a right to kill everyone else because didn't God tell them to do that in the Old Testament? Well, actually, no, he didn't, but the fundamental right wing of the evangelical church and the political right wing in the US particularly, but also in the UK to a degree, they support this premise of supporting Israel. But actually the hardliners, John Hagee and people like that, they actually fundamentally want war in the Middle East because they see a war in the Middle East is going to bring Jesus back. Because in their eschatology, Jesus is coming back with an after Armageddon or during Armageddon or before Armageddon, depending on which philosophy of tribulationism that you believe. Ultimately, they believe that there should be war and therefore they don't even do anything to promote peace because, well, war is God's agenda. And it's like, how can you possibly completely misrepresent god like that but they do because because the whole dispensational premillennial rapture teaching and zionism and christian zionism is a complete fabrication and a total deception and of course they buy into it and it's a it's political suicide to say anything against israel in the u.s because of the power of the media and the power of, of Jewish influence. And I've got nothing against Jews or Israelis, whatever. And of course, what happened, you know, in October was horrendous, what those people did, you know, and of course they should be held to account. But what has happened subsequently in killing thousands and thousands of innocent civilians is not proportional to what happened. And therefore, Christians should be promoting peace. We should be peacemakers. Didn't Jesus tell us that blessed are the peacemakers? Not the warmongers. But, you know, there's a theology that says that Israel is God's people. Israel were never God's people. If you look at Paul teaching, only those of faith of Abraham were God's people. And that has always been the same. Those of faith. So today, there's only one people of God. There's only ever been one people of God. And Paul in Romans 9 says, not all Israel are actually Israel, true Israel. You know, and now he's reconfigured it in the new covenant of, you know, the true Jew is one who has their heart circumcised. Nothing to do with whether you're ethnically or not. It's a spiritual issue, not a physical one. But it's been promoted physically. I mean, look back at the history of the establishing of the state of Israel. It was politically motivated to get America into the First and Second World War with promises of a homeland for the Jewish people. That was the history of it. Balfour Declaration. That's the history of it. And they had pretty much peace in, in Palestine before that. You know, people, Jewish people, Christian people, Palestinian people were all living pretty much okay together in that area and all of a sudden you dispossess six seven hundred thousand people 
and give it to another group of people, mostly who were European and never had any ethnic or right to the land whatsoever because they come from Europe and were Jews by religion. Why suddenly should people fleeing Europe and Russia and, and all the other places suddenly have a whole land in Palestine? Well, that's where we started all these issues with the West backing that thing because they promised on the basis of political things. And Zionism and the original Zionists were the original terrorists. Look at what the Zionists did. You know, they they killed a lot of people to get their point over. They were known as terrorists. You know, now I'm I'm against Zionism and political Zionism. I'm not against Jewish people. They've got a right to, to follow their religion if they want to, just as Muslims do and Hindus do and Buddhists do and whatever else. If they want to follow that, then they've got a right to do so. And, and you know, do I believe that that's the answer and they're going to get to God? No, <laughs> you know, um, but I do believe that fundamentally they got a right. And if they want to follow Judaism, so be it. Let them follow it, Judaism. But Christianity is not Judaism plus Jesus. Yeah, you know, it is a new covenant which is completely separate from the obsolete old covenant that ended. Now we're living in a new covenant. There's only one new man in Christ. There is only Jews and Gentiles together in one new man in Christ. So we don't call people Jews and Gentiles anymore from a Christian perspective. Paul said, now the wall of partition has been removed. Now there is only one new man in Christ. There aren't, you know, in, and of course, in Galatians, it also talks about, well, there's no Jew nor gentle. There's no bond or free and there's no male or female in the kingdom. It's all one. We don't have these delineations anymore. So it's a challenge. And I know, you know, even posting this will probably offend a lot of people. You know, I come from that background. I come from a brethren background. I come from the, the, that root that actually created all this problem with Darby and the, you know, premillennialist dispensationist teaching, you know, and the Schofield Bible that promoted it and all of that, you know, I understand the nature and the history of it, you know, but it doesn't excuse what is going on in the Middle East right now. Yeah, nothing excuses killing people indiscriminately. Nothing excuses what's going on in Russia right now or the Yemen or any other place that is operating in war, and indiscriminately killing people. Yeah, it's an horrendous thing. As Christians, we should be promoting peace and be peacemakers. Mike, we should not take insights. Mike, I, everything you said is dead on, I realize. But the fact is that the problem becomes that mindsets are programmed, as you taught us from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And that's my enemy. And you can even see it over here, and you can see it over in the UK. People that immigrate, they yeah. carry the same yeah. hatred yeah. where they are in their new homeland, even though the clashes are going on, and they're continuing with each other. And it's just not between the Palestinians and the Israelis; it's with the Sri Lankans and everyone else. Oh yeah. And the fact is, without and that becomes their truth because it's so deeply embedded. By golly, I can't change my neural pathways when I know they're wrong. Yeah. But, but when I think it's the truth. It yeah. becomes without some God doing something spiritually, peace at best, we talk about it, is an illusion because it's only temporal unless God does something spiritual. And so better, you better protect yourself in the meantime, because you know what, if you have peace in the Middle East it, between Palestine and Israel, as we've seen through our whole life, it's very temporal and they're going to be going back at it. Yeah, and unless they come up with a solution which is based on forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, you know, if you look into South Africa, when Nelson Mandela, you know, became president, immediately he looked to introduce sort of reget reconciliation courts in which they looked to forgive the things of the past on both sides. He was a very smart guy. And, you know, all right, South Africa is not in a perfect shape, you know, but it's after right now, South Africa. Hmm? South Africa is a disaster right now. It is in ways, yeah, politically.
but there's not and the such... racism is greater than ever well no i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that's totally i wouldn't true. want to be a white person with a farm there well <laughs> no uh, but unfortunately his ideas weren't carried forward and continued into the political system and everything else so again it falls down when it's not implemented and continued so it becomes generational and each generation carries the forgiveness of the last generation onwards and if you only have to look about all the different places in the world where we've seen genocide and different things you know yugoslavia you know the serbs croats bosnians uh, i mean it's horrendous stuff why because old political and ethnic issues rose up after communism and caused all that stuff there, which was terrible because it's unforgiveness from generations. The present generation didn't know. I mean, the younger generation didn't know what happened years ago, but they had it propagated within their DNA, probably within epigenetic factors that made them embrace that hugely. And it is a huge problem. And the only answer is forgiveness. True forgiveness, you know, letting it go forgiving people for what they've done and cancelling the past debt so there is no future debt outstanding that's the only way to bring about reconciliation and true reconciliation and unfortunately it's difficult for people to do it you know and because people don't embrace it fully and properly they may say yes we forgive them but they don't cancel the debt so they're still looking at what happened 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago or back further in some some instances, because it's become embedded within the culture of those people. And ultimately, it, that means things are temporary unless you fought, do it properly. You know, so if you're going to solve the problem in the Middle East, you know, it's not just Palestinians and Israelis. You've got to take the whole whole region and whatever historically they have going on and they're going to let it all go but how's that going to happen it isn't going to happen politically although they can try political means to try and create a two-state place and to try and deal with the past but will it happen politically no because political system is is only part of the story we need the kingdom of god we need an awakening to god and love to which then true forgiveness can be given. You know, and I know people who have suffered horrendous things, who have genuinely forgiven and now hold no bitterness or resentment. You know, I know people whose son was, you know, he was a policeman in the UK, was killed, murdered, but they publicly came out and forgave the person who did it. And they then wrote book on, books, looks on forgiveness because they genuinely put it into practice when it was the rubber hitting the road it's all very well saying we'd forgive anything anybody anything but what happened if they killed your son or daughter you know what happened what would you do then well ultimately i hope we would all do what god would do to us which is forgive us but it would be a choice not an emotional thing we wouldn't feel like it you can't love your enemies as brotherly love when they've just robbed you or killed you killed someone but you can agape love them. You can choose to be what God is to them in terms of forgiveness, what he's done to us. But it's not easy. And it's a huge choice that people have to make. And ultimately, without God to make that choice, it ain't going to happen. No, it's not going to happen without people knowing the forgiveness that God gives them. So then they can love others the way they've been loved, which brings forgiveness into it. And to bring reconciliation. So it is a kingdom issue. You know, and ultimately we're not there yet. Which which is an e internal. Within you. But in, the, in reality. Externally for example. You'd still have to protect yourself. From that person you might. Internally know you need to love. Mm. And forgive so that you won't get hurt by them oh absolutely yeah forgiveness is not oh well i'm just going to turn the other cheek and let them kill me or something 
turn the other cheek was about an internal, I'm not going to choose vengeance. So I'd rather turn the other cheek than hit someone back. It didn't mean you had to turn the other cheek and let someone smash the other one, but better do that than carry unforgiveness and bitterness. That's what Jesus was saying. Yeah, people again take it literally. Oh, go away and you know, let turn the other cheek and let someone hit the other one. Rather do that than carry bitterness, which is toxic to your whole life. That's what Jesus was saying there. But actually, in reality, it is better to do that than to be destroyed inwardly. But ultimately, you've got to outwork the reality of it in practice. And when I've forgiven someone, if they still are operating in the same way, I don't have to open up my life to that person again. You know, I can be free from that person. I don't have to open up my life to that person again and let them do it again. Doesn't mean I haven't forgiven them, but I'm not stupid. You know, and I think we don't really need, again, need to be gullible as Christians and expect just because I've forgiven someone that the other person is going to change. And if the other person hasn't changed, I am going to treat them in a way to make sure that they don't do the same thing again. And I don't think that's totally valid. And I don't think that in any way undermines forgiveness. Because forgiveness is me letting go of what they have done to me or anybody else so that it's not affecting me any longer. I am not going to be bitter and, and full of resentment towards what someone's done, which is toxic to me. So forgiveness is something that benefits me, not the other person necessarily. It can benefit them. If they know I've forgiven them and it helps them receive that forgiveness and maybe want to change as a result of it. But my forgiveness is not based on them changing. My forgiveness is based on my choice. But if they don't change, you know, I'm not going to carry on giving them access to carry on doing the same thing. And I think this is true in marriages and all sorts of relationships where the Christian view is, well, you've got to stay within that relationship because this marriage or whatever it might be and it's like no you don't you don't have to stay in an abusive situation at all but you do need to forgive otherwise you carry that onwards into any other relationship you end up in if you don't deal with it then but it doesn't mean you have to stay there yeah. so almost we've moved from a position of what we saw as old testament is offense Mm. to forgiveness and kind of necessary self-defense yeah yeah but i think we need to love ourselves to be able to love others and if we don't value and love ourselves as god loves us and he doesn't want any harm to come with us then we won't treat ourselves that way we need to look after ourselves but to do it with the right heart and the right motive, not to do it with cynicism and skepticism and, you know, carrying sort of negative emotions to a situation, but to be real. You know, I've forgiven that person, but they have not changed. Therefore, I'm not going to carry on letting them do what they did before. But I will give them, you know, I'm not going to cut them off you know, in a way. You know what I mean? It's like. I can remove myself from the situation and still look for them to be free and for them to change, you know, but ultimately forgiveness is benefits me so that they're free from my bitterness and resentment. And hopefully they're free for God to intervene in their lives. I hand them over to God. When I forgive someone, I want God to work in their life because I still want the, their genuine blessing on them. And that would be for them to come into the fullness of the, who they are and not have to operate the way they're operating for whatever reason they are, whether they're operating out of what's been done to them and they may have not forgiven and dealt with what's happened to them. So they perpetuate the same thing over and over again. We need to make sure we don't perpetuate stuff by dealing with it in us so that we're at least free from that in our own lives. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.